What's up traders, welcome back to another trader interview on the channel here. I hope you are gonna like this one. The guest here is someone that I highly respect first of all. But before we begin, if you're not subscribed yet to the channel, click the subscribe button below that way you'll be notified of the interviews and videos I publish quite often. My goal here is to be able to help you with your trading and help you get to eventually trade full time, have more freedom in your life and all these cool things with trading. So, so if you wanna receive that advice, subscribe below. Now my guest today in this interview is none other than Jack Schwager. Jack came here a few times on the podcast. It's someone that I, I really admire. It's someone that interviews traders and I think pretty much everyone knows it for now so that's good. This time we talk about some of the unknown traders he's talked to recently and some of the people that made really really big returns in trading overall but did it in a way that we're not like trading for banks or we're not necessarily that known out there so the people that are more unknown. And so Jack has really good advice on that, as well as things that these people do different than other people. So you'll love this one, I'm sure. Without further ado, let's dive right into the interview. Jack, tell me with all those years of interviewing traders and, and writing Market Wizards book, what keeps you going? What is the thing that makes you excited about doing it or happy about doing these interviews and talking to traders? I mean, I'm curious to hear that. Yeah, it's always different. So you're, you're dealing with the same, with different people. And um, you could always learn something new. So, you know, the project, the project of doing any Market Wizards book is, is enjoyable in some sense, as, as is the, you know, the, the process of <clears throat> taking these raw transcripts and turning them into something readable. So it's always a little bit of a challenge and it, um, it's always satisfactory if it turns out okay. It seems to me like when I read a book, when I read Market Research, especially your, your latest book, uh, talking about some mostly unknown traders, it seems to me like the interviews flow really well. Like there's a good, good conversation between you and the trader. Is it always the same way? Or is there some, some times where you can have to reframe what they say or make it flow better? Or is it really natural for them to talk about what they do? You mean on any single interview or? So what I'm asking is, is it easy for you to find these kind of tips or to kind of make the interview flow, flow well for the book? Or do you have to kind of maybe uh, have them talk more or cut some parts or find a way to kind of have them share what they do? Or is that easy for you to, to kind of hear what they have to say? No, I mean, it's um, the actual interview itself is, is the easy part. And you just go as long as you can and try to pay attention to what they're saying and go off on any interesting tangents and just <clears throat> try to gather as much interesting material as you can. It's not going to be verbatim. So it's not like you're doing a live interview show. You do it for half an hour, and that's exactly what everybody hears. This is more like you take 10 hours, and then you boil it down into what would be equivalent to an hour, you know, if, if that was all it was, you know. So, so that's the, you know, or maybe an hour and a half. It's a matter of the editing down uh, that can transform it into something that works well. Some traders are better than others interview. Some have lots of anecdotes or some are better at explaining what, what they can do. So it is a bit dependent on, of course, on the material that you have. But uh, as long as you have within the whole context of the interview, enough interesting material for a chapter, that's all that counts. In the past, we've been known for interviewing these like big, either bank traders or people that had like really, they were like really well known out there and they had like really good stories. What made you want to go after the traders that are more unknown, which are for me as good as the other ones, but what made you go after them? Basically, the idea goes back to when we formed Fund Cedar, uh, which, uh, which for me, I still I'll assume most listeners maybe don't know what it is, but it's basically a platform for traders that. They can link their accounts or upload their, their return data and have uh, access to free performance analytics uh, uh, and other types of analytics. Uh, and our purpose, the reason we provide that is when we're not charging for that, but the idea is to, to use that as a lure to find traders worldwide who are exceptional or, um, you know, have, have had very, very good track records in return risk terms. And these are the types of traders which you would basically find. They're just like individuals trading from their own office or things like that. So the idea was this was a tool to find undiscovered trading talent. And from the beginning, it seemed that if this tool worked, 
in the process, you'd find traders who could then be used as, uh, as subjects in a, in a market wizard book. So from that point on, the concept was, uh, and part of the thing on the site said, that traders who, who link up with Fundseeder will have the opportunity to, to be discovered for a future market wizard book, which in fact turned out to be a case for about four of the traders in the book. And the other ones were found through personal connections or people yeah, that you heard so about? I knew some. I, I knew Peter Brandt, who's the one trader who is not unknown because uh, he has a uh, large Twitter following, but he's he's still relatively unknown in the investment world. It's just a segment the traders know him. But for the most part, they're all pretty, you know, they, they're just people, they're just individuals, people don't know them. Uh, so, but I knew a few of them, so I knew Peter Brandt personally. Uh, and two of the other traders had contacted me before I did the book. And so uh, one on a completely different matter, but when we met, you know, uh, he told me about his background and I realized that he would be a great subject for a book. And, um, and the other one had sent me his record oh, about a year before I decided to do the book. And I told him that I, you know, his track record's amazing, but, um, you know, if I'm not, I wasn't planning at that time to do a book, but if I did, I would get back to him and, he, and if he could supply me uh, evidence of his record, then I would certainly be interested. I mean, he claimed to have made $2,500, turned $2,500 into $50 million. And uh, actually, when I got back to him and said, well, if you can prove it, he did. He did send me all the statements. So... Uh, that turned out to be actually, a, you know, uh, so there are three traders that I knew before doing the book. And like I said, four came from, uh, from Fun Cedar. And then uh, I did a tweet asking people, I'm doing another, I'm planning to do another Market Wizards book. I'm looking for solo, relatively unknown traders with long-term phenomenal records. If you fit the bill or know somebody who does, let me know. And I got hundreds of responses. And out of those 100 responses, I had the remaining people in the book. Plus, I had some that I never got to. So I actually had more than appear in the book in that sense. So those were the three sources of, uh, of traders. Yeah, that's interesting. I think from there, it's not that hard to find traders, uh, especially online now. It's not that hard to find them. Yeah, you can find tons of traders. But remember, I'm looking for traders with track records of, you know, of 10 years and longer, much longer if possible. And with return risk numbers that are just kind of totally off the charts. So I'm not looking for traders with sharp ratios of one or something, which might be perfectly fine, but that's not what I'm looking for. Um, so I'm looking more for, for you know, traders who have Sortino, and I use Sortino ratio, I prefer it to the sharp. Um, but if you calculate the Sortino correctly, which most people don't, so that it's comparable to the sharp, um, then I'm looking for Sartinos that would be, you know, five or higher. And there are some in the book that are higher than 10, higher than 15 even. So those type of track records you just don't find normally. Uh, I'm sure there are many people besides those that I found, but as a percent of all traders, we're talking a minute fraction. So I'm pretty sure people here watching this are familiar with your concept of your book, Market Wizard, where you interview different traders, put the interviews in the book. I think that's that's the key for most people. And in that book, you talk about traders who are more, of course, unknown. So is there any one trader you talked to this time that really impacted you, that you really felt inspired by, or that was really special to you? You know, there were, you know, just a, there were a number of traders who had just phenomenal... Well, there's one, one trader who was particularly impressive because he had figured out a way to trade that involved neither fundamentals nor te technical. So that to me was so unique. Plus he, he's done remarkably well. I think he's compounded at like 65% a year in the last 15 years. Uh, but the, the, the really incredible part of that, and, and he's turned like a sub $100,000 account into 25 million or whatever he's up to at this moment. Um, and all those are all that all that is amazing, but the really amazing thing is that he did it without using any technical analysis or any or any fundamental analysis. And I didn't before doing this book, I didn't realize there was any other alternative. Uh, so he was particularly 
and he also had great anecdotes. So, so he was a particularly good interview that I liked. The trader I mentioned who turned uh, 2550 million was quite a story, quite amazing. And then, you know, but that's not to downplay any of the other traders in the book. Uh, especially like Peter Brand, for sure. That was, for me, one of the great ones in the book. It was the first yes. one, of course. That, that was really good. Uh, and and look for, I'm looking forward to read the other one, for sure. So that's going to be really good, really interesting. Yeah. And Brandt, actually, ironically, was mentioned, I think, by at least two other traders, if not three other traders in the book, as an influence. And interestingly, the traders that mentioned him were fundamental traders rather than technical traders. So Brandt is known for a you know, chart trader, but, but his real thing is money management. And as he will, he will tell you. And uh, that's what the traders, the other traders in the book who mentioned it, picked up on were his money management guidelines. And uh, Very good. Uh, at the end of the book, you kind of bring together some big concepts that can help people become good traders in the future. Do you mind kind of going into these concepts or these kind of themes that you see around many traders that they have in common? Are there some things that you have to be able to focus on, you have to do to be able to become successful? The answer yeah. to that is yes and yes. Uh, they certainly have certain things in common, but they also are all different. They all use different methodologies. They have different personalities. They trade different markets. They have different time frame of, on their trades. Um, you know, so there's not commonality like that, but they do all pay a lot of attention to, to risk management. Um, they all are very disciplined, you know, some extraordinarily so. Uh, I think all, if not mo most, if not all of them, uh, pay a lot of attention to their own, to the, to some, to the psychology of trading, to their own mindset, to their, to where they emotionally are at the time they're trading. Uh, what emotional influences might are they picking up about themselves that could impede their trading, or might be a clue to how to trade? So. Uh, so there are like those types of similarities, uh, uh, you know, the ability to get out of their position in a in a in a split second if they think they're they're wrong. So those are types of commonalities, but not methodology wise. So the methodology always varies between traders. They always have a different way of doing things, yes. or they might even go against each other sometimes. Yes, they all they all even you know I mean broadly speaking, almost all of them used. I, I didn't have to use the word almost before this book, but almost all of them use either technical analysis or chart analysis or some combination of the two. So that's one broad choice. But, um, you know, within any of those, there's a million ways to do things, you know, and lots of different ways uh, of how to approach a trade, how to exit a trade, which markets to trade, how long to hold a trade, what specific methodology to use to, say, to signal trades, what clues one picks up from how the market is responding to, uh, to news, et cetera, et cetera. I believe the first time we spoke was in 2017, and that's where you were beginning Funds Healer. Since then, there's been a lot of different prof firms that came up online and offered to manage capital and different things. What would be your advice to people who want to be able to get more capital from either investors or prof firms to be able to kind of increase or scale up their trading? What would be your advice to them? If you can trade well and you can get the attention of a prop firm, they're always looking for people to allocate to. You have to have a skill. You have to be a skilled trader and be able to prove it. And then, you know, it's a matter of, there's certainly people interested in that. And it's a matter of finding them. And uh, you may need to have connections or not. But, uh, you know, I think if you do have the skill, that's certainly theoretically achievable because there's a demand for that skill. And if you have it, you, you could theoretically find some people to allocate as long as you can demonstrate your track record is valid. Uh, of course, you know, fund seeder is kind of the, our idea is to, partner with prop firms or allocators and sort of be a conduit for traders in that way. And so that's actually part of our, our kind of mission. You know, up till now, we've just focused on the technology side of the platform, but we're currently in negotiations with some large allocators, one or more of which will go through. Uh, at least, I mean, I, I think at least one will go through, if not more. So 
Uh, so within a few months, we we should be in the position to to provide our database to an allocator interested in finding traders. You mentioned having connections, and I think that plays a big role in trading and pretty much anything in life. And it's for sure something that you excel at, being able to have connections with traders all around the world. Uh, what would be the keys to be able to do that? How do you get connections in trading? How would you do it? Be lucky. You know, uh, I mean, look, a lot of people, if you're born in the wrong country, you have, you know, skills. You, If you're in a country which has no real market, you know, economic, you know, financial types of markets, or you don't have, you've never gone to a named school or, you know, all sorts of things can be impediments. So uh, your chances are a lot better, of course, if you go to, if you're in the U.S. and you go to an Ivy League school and get a job with a hedge fund, you know, you know that's the type of resume that makes it easier to get attention. But for speaking globally, the majority of people don't have the connections, you know, which is, again, one thing that we're trying to do. But, you know, if that's the case, uh, it's more difficult, you know, because the world isn't fair in that respect. You could be the most skilled trader and never get anybody's attention if you're not in the right place. <clears throat> or have gone to the right schools. I'm guessing that now when you send an email to a trader or someone around you, they, they already know who you are, even if they didn't talk with you before. Yeah. How was it back then when you had to kind of reach out to those people, but you had to get them to be interested in, in talking to you? You're quite right, you know, uh, that now uh, almost anybody I ask to be in a book knows who I am. I guess it's really the exception uh, for me to ask somebody and they won't know you. I can't think of anybody in this book that kind of didn't know who I was already. Um, so it makes it easier. Uh, my first book, I had a bit of luck there in that <clears throat> I knew Michael Marcus, who was the first chapter in that book, who ended up being the first chapter in that book. And, I, and that was just a matter of luck that my first job on Wall Street was the job he was leaving. And I met him when he, he was cleaning out his desk and I was moving in. And we talked, and while he was in New York, we got together sort of semi-frequently. So I knew him. He also worked for Managing Money for Commodities Corp. He hired Bruce Kovner, so I knew Bruce Kovner. Uh, Marcus then, after I interviewed him, was so satisfied with how the interview went, he told me about Ed Sakota, who was his mentor, and... Uh, Then I, you know, I forget, I might have known somebody who knew Paul Tudor Jones, I don't remember. So, but I had, I knew some people and some of those people knew other people and a few are just cold, cold, cold ass. But I did have the edge of having some connections and knowing some people. I didn't start completely from a blank page because that would have been difficult. Do you feel like it's possible for a trader to become successful on its own? Uh, like without having connections to other traders or without talking to other traders? Sure. I mean, a number of traders in his book, you know, just totally self-taught and didn't have connections with other traders. I mean, some of the traders came to careers where they might have learned some stuff or had some mentor, some guidance, but it's not like they got their methodology from somebody else totally or anything. And for a number of traders in the book, there was just no no other real trader influence except to maybe chat rooms or something like that. But a number of traders just sort of self-taught, found their own way, developed their own methodology, don't talk to traders routinely. Uh, so it goes all the way to that end of the spectrum where the traders, you know, developed everything independent of everybody else. Interesting. So like we mentioned before, there's no one way to do it. You can do it whatever we want. As with two conditions. One, that it's a it's a strategy that is compatible with your personality. So if you're somebody who gets bored very quickly, having a strategy that gets four brilliant trades a year is not going to work for you because you'll just do a lot of stupid stuff between the four trades. So it has to be a, a strategy compatible with your personality. And second, which is really more important, is whatever you come up with has to have some sort of edge. So it's not like you can do anything. You gotta, you can use any methodology or any combination of methodologies or rules or whatever to come up with an approach that does demonstrate an edge, and that's demonstrated through through the equity you know curve. 
uh, that has a demonstrated edge and if and it has to be compatible with you so you can trade it properly. So those are those are the two conditions. A lot of people place a lot of emphasis on back testing or find like testing your strategy first before going live. There's some people that I've heard about don't test at all. Have you heard of these kind of traders who don't test anything, just go in the market first and that's the way yeah, of testing? Well, Look, in this book, almost all the traders are discretionary rather than there's one trader who is purely systematic. Another trader is primarily discretionary and is now working a little bit with systems. But predominantly, almost all the traders are discretionary. And you can't, you can't backtest discretion, right? Because you don't know. You know, even if you have some sort of methodology, say you buy a chart pattern that looks like this. Well, chart, there's a lot of interpretation. Whatever this is, whatever you define that chart pattern as being, there's going to be things that look more like it, less like it. Which ones do you qualify as fitting that rule? Which doesn't? Uh, what is your emotional state at that time? You know, maybe you would have taken that trade, but you're just taking a couple of losses. And in reality, if you were in that situation, you wouldn't have taken it. Although looking back at it, look, you say, oh yeah, I would have taken that. But you don't know, uh, you know, how... Would you have lapsed in your risk management? How would that affect the other trades? So it's impossible to test for a discretionary trader you know, uh, to, to do tests. I, they can test certain of the rules they have. They say, well, you know, whenever you have these four factors at the same time, that's a good time to go long. Well, you can test that, but you can't test yourself. As, hey, but that's not going to be your whole approach. You're going to have lots of different things you might look at. So you can test any specific set of rules that you can back test and with the proviso that you avoid the pitfall of hindsight bias. But let's say you back test correctly, do not have hindsight bias, have enough data, then yeah, you can check, check if certain types of rules work, but you can't back test your uh, being a discretionary trader. That you'll just, you just own up. You can't backtest that. So how do these people know that they have a clear edge in the market? It's well, because of experience in the years in the market? Because they come up with things that seem to work and then they try it and it works. And over time, they're seeing that their winning trades are bigger than their losing trades and they're gradually making money. And yeah, they have their losses, but they don't get like deep, vicious drawdowns. So over time, they're getting an equity curve that is not, you know, not perfectly smooth going up, but generally just continues to go up without lots of large drawdowns. And particularly if it's going up by a good percentage rate a year, they get to the point where they have confidence that their approach really does have an edge. And it's not something that you can prove like mathematically that they have an edge, but it's kind of an assumption that they can reach based on the evidence of their past performance and having hypotheses that are borne out by how the market responds to their actions. So it's not perfect, but they get to a point where they is, where the evidence, it's an empirical thing, not a theoretical thing. Empirically, it appears that they've got an edge in the way they're doing it. And they get the, they all, these traders who are really superior get to points where they really have super confidence in their approach. That's interesting to me. For me being systematic, that's pretty really strange, but I do understand the fact that it could be a way to do it for sure. Yeah, and so it's, like I say, being, if you're systematic, it's the analogy is not the same. You can back test systems, again, with the proviso that you avoid hindsight bias. And that comes up in, this, in the systematic trader in this book. You have to be flexible enough to know that any system that you've developed, even if tested correctly, can work for, continue to work for a while and stop working. That's always a possibility that, uh, that you're not just seeing a drawdown but the system itself has stopped working or will not work for a long enough time that the cumulative damage is too great. The great difficulty in systematic trading is making that determination, which is, which is never certain, which is the best an educated guess as to whether, yes, the system has deteriorated to the point of not being usable or it's just a drawdown and I got to stick with it. That is the most difficult decision for a systematic trader, as you probably know. No. Have you talked with any algorithmic trader in the past? Is this something that you think is getting more popular for traders or is this something that 
good no, tuners often you want to use. Yeah, I mean, I think in every Walker Wizards book, there are some systematic traders. So, uh, uh, and the systems can be all sorts of different things. They can be highly sophisticated, quant-driven, somebody like a D.E. Shaw, you know, for example, where, where he's, you know, basically, of course, it's a firm that's very secretive, just like Renaissance and firms of that type, but essentially using scores of mathematical models, uh, trading the interrelationships between tens of thousands of securities. I mean, just very complex. So looking for, basically looking for a thousand small inefficiencies in the market, which are probably always changing and, and so forth. That's a systematic approach I, in a literal sense, but not what people think of when they talk about systems. And then there are you know, people who will develop systems that are you know, more oriented towards capturing trends, which has become more difficult, or some map, some sort of uh, pattern recognition. Majority of traders tend to be discretionary because it's very difficult to come up with systems that get very, very superior return risk. Uh, it's more common to find those type of records among discretionary traders. So while I have had systematic and discretionary traders in all the books, uh, the majority tend to be discretionary. So that would mean that the human aspect adds to a, a kind of system? It, it makes it better? Well, absolutely. I mean, it is anything that you can put down. Other than, like I say, if you get away, if, if you exclude the super complex multiple strategies, which are just really taking out tiny inefficiencies from market. But if you sue that and talk about a system being something that a trader develops to trade the markets, just like long, short, not, not to do a million different trades that are kind of all interrelated and trying to get a slight edge. So if you're doing that type of systematic trading, or if you get something that you can kind of spell out in a set of rules, it's not impossible, but I mean, it's hard for those set of rules to account for all the variations and to, if followed blindly by a computer, to yield not, you know, it can be profitable, it can even do pretty good, but to yield extraordinary return to risk is, is very difficult uh, because th those extra boosted returns come from things that humans kind of notice. You know, it's not that something, I'll give you an example, sort of Michael Marcus uh, talking about one of the most, uh, one of his most uh, memorable trades. And so it was, this is way back in, uh, in the 80s, it was a big bull market in soybeans. First, in fact, the first really modern age, super, super bull market in soybeans. And Michael Mark is a trader of Commodities Corp. He's a big trader and he has on a huge position. And a, a USDA rep crop report comes out and it's wildly bullish for soybeans. And Michael has a huge position, but it's not quite, it's not all the way to the CFTC limit, you know? So as you might know, Commodity Futures Trading Commission has on agricultural products as a maximum size the speculator can hold. So he could have, he didn't have the full, and he was kicking himself, even though he had a tremendous position and this was great news. So he, so the next morning before the markets open, he puts in an order to buy as many you know, up to the position limit. And he doesn't expect to ever get filled. He, he's expecting the market to be limited up for the next three days and his order won't get executed. And then he gets a call from the broker, you know, 10 minutes after the market saw, uh, open, good news, we got to fill. And in an instant, in a flash, he realizes that is not good news. He immediately dumps what he bought, dumps his entire position, and he's selling so wildly, he says it's the only time in his life that he made money through trading errors because he ended up selling even more contracts than he had. Uh, because he just realized in that instant that this market should have gone up three limits and here it is trading. He realized what that meant. That is difficult to put into a computer because that's one instance. There's a million instances like that. And traders who are really skilled kind of picked up these things. And it's very hard. I mean, you could, you could literally translate 
that example into some algorithm. But you'd have to do that for every such situation. That's what's very difficult. That's very interesting. It, it's an aspect of studying I've not really looked into much. So that, that really is interesting. The fact that, yeah, these big trades can happen, not with the system, but with some external things and with you making the at that time. So that's, that's really interesting. Right. I mean, so that's, I mean, that's an illustration of why, mm. why I think discretionary traders are the, it's easier for them to realize because the one decision like that, you know, could be, could, I mean, just a gigantic percentage difference in, in, in the outcome. You know, it could mean the difference between making 100% on a trade and losing 30% or something like that could, on, on the whole equity of the account. So it could have just one little decision like that could have an enormous impact. And, you know, systematic trading doesn't work that way. What do you think things are heading in this trading? Is it more towards, you think, our goals in AI or you think traders also have a place manually in the market? Yeah, I still believe the trend is is towards AI or or at least quantification. I mean, AI is one type of approach or quantification, you know, one type of multiple types <laughs> subsets, but it's one overall approach. Uh, so it's not always the machine learning. It it could just be the analysis of existing data that leads to to rules, uh, and that could be allowed to evolve through machine learning, but. Yeah, so that trend will continue. All I can say is that at least as of having written this book, and for people with track records of 10, 15 years from now, you know, prior to now, that at least for this recent period, which has seen enormous, you know, enormous uh, progress in both computer processing and in a number of people using that day, you know, using, you know, computers to, to quantify using big data, et cetera. So that has been so enormous. And yet, at least as of now, it's still possible to find people with return risk records that are extraordinary. So it's still, you know, at least as of now, it's still possible, right? I would have thought that even at this point, it would be more difficult, but apparently people still find their own niches and it's still it's still possible to, to do. Uh, I think the problem with the markets is so complex and because, and this is a point I've made a number of times before, the difference between markets and other problems like, uh, you know, physics problems of multiple bodies and, and you know, where, where are bodies going to be given the other interrelationships, that no matter how complex that problem becomes, ultimately it's solvable because of, uh, you know, all the bodies are following the same you know, set of physics rules. They're not always changing. But in the markets, the rules are always changing. Federal, you know, some markets, central bank actions have enormous consequences. In some, it does, you know, they don't. I mean, I, I can think back, you know, many years ago where money supply was the most important thing that anybody could ever consider when trading bonds. And then you get the points where people don't even look at it or it's a minor thing. Uh, you've got times when stocks and bonds go to, are correlated positively. There are times when they're negatively correlated. There are times where they're not correlated. You know, so you can do that for anything. So the point is that the rules are always changing. There are no fixed relationships. And that limits the potential to solve, so-called solve the problem by brute force, because you can't define the equations that everything follows from. You know, you can do it in physics, but you can't do it in, in trading. So I think that's one thing that makes it more difficult to ever go to a point where it's all computers. I'm really curious to see how things will evolve with that. It's an interesting topic for sure. And I do want to see more manual trading in the future as well. I don't want to see it all being to algos or AI for sure. But at the same time, we'll see how things unfold with that. I think it's very interesting to look at. Yeah, I mean, I don't have anything in there besides that, what I, before what I just said. Awesome. So where can people find you if they want to connect with you or reach out after this interview? And where can they buy your book, which yeah. I highly recommend, of course? Well, the book's anywhere. You know, any any place you would normally buy a book from, the book will be there. You know, un, unknown market wizards. And, uh, you know, my site is, the company site is fund, F-U-N-D, Cedar, S-E-E-D-E-R, fundcedar.com. And so if you're interested in that, you can check that out. Uh, my personal side website is Jack Schwager, 
uh, dot com, and uh, my tw uh, on Twitter it's at Jack Schwager. So uh, in both cases, it's just my name. You know, Twitter with the hat sign, hat sign, and on the web with the dot com. Perfect. I'm actually put these things below as well in the description of the video and the podcast channel as well. And I would like people, if they read your book already, if they read this uh, Unknown Market Wizard book already, they can download the video with their number one advice or the, the best advice I heard from the book. I'd love to hear that. That way you can keep the conversation going, of course, in the comment. And you guys can show what you've learned so far. Well, you know, so look, I, that's been good. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I finished the book with 46, 46 kind of lessons. So it's hard to say, you know, one, you know, any of course. Lesson, yeah. Afford, but it's something that, that they can relate to, or that is all fun. Yeah, I'll be curious to hear that. Awesome. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate you, Tom, for being here. I think yeah. it's another good book you wrote, and it's going to change the life of a lot of others as well. I know people who chat to me, they read your book before, they love it, and it kind of stuff that inspired them to go the right way, or it inspired them to kind of learn more things or go in one action specifically. So I think that's awesome work you're doing with that. And look forward to connect with you again for sure.